Good day everyone. We're now going to discuss some of the possible questions that might come up in the upcoming 2022 bar examinations on the subject of labor law. Again, disclaimer, all these are based on our own intuition, our own opinion, and it did not come from any other source. So again, take it with a grain of salt. In 2015, Rosano was hired as a seaman by Maersk, Filipino Screwing Incorporated. On board the vessel, Rosano felt moderate pain upon carrying a heavy motor. He was diagnosed with prolapsed lumbar disc and eventually got repatriated back to the Philippines. He was placed in the care of company-designated physicians, which declared him unfit for work with disability grade 1, partial disability and was offered disability benefits. However, Razon insisted on obtaining total and permanent disability benefits. So he consulted another orthopedic expert, Mr. Magtira, who diagnosed him permanently unfit in any capacity to resume his duties as a seaman. Razon filed a complaint before the National Conciliation and Mediation Board claiming total and permanent disability benefits plus damages. Was Razon entitled to total and permanent disability benefits? Yes, Razon is entitled to total and permanent disability benefits because the company designated physicians failed to issue a valid medical assessment within the prescribed period under the law. The PUEA standard Employment contract governs the procedure for this claim of disability benefits and provides for the period when the company designated physician must issue a final medical assessment. Despite the issuance of a purportedly final disability grading in the disability report, Razon was still required to return almost a month later for re-evaluation with results in the medical report issued in the same day. Taking these two documents together, the medical assessment was clearly not a final one because it still required further action on the part of the company designated physicians. Without such a valid, final, and definitive assessment from the company designated physicians, the law already steps in to consider the seafarer's disability as total and permanent. Based on the case of Saldi Razonable v. Marsk, Filipina screwing. Pastrami was an environmental team leader on board the vessel Carnival Fascination owned by Bahonia Shipping Services. He experienced lower back pain after lifting a head. 3, 2, 1. He experienced lower back pain after lifting a heavy waste bin. He was repatriated back to the Philippines for medical treatment. Pastrami reported to the company designated physician who diagnosed him to be fit to work. In another assessment, he was declared unfit to work since he still had a stiff trunk and a painful gait. Then another company designated physician diagnosed him with herniated disc. According to the doctor, he is entitled or benefits covering a disability grading of 11. However, a private doctor declared him permanently unfit in any capacity, so he demands for total and permanent disability benefits from Bahonia in a complaint before the labor arbiter. Is Pastrami entitled to permanent and total disability benefits? Yes, Pastrami is entitled to permanent and total disability benefits because under legal contemplation, he is totally and permanently disabled. Under Section 32 of the POEA Standard Employment Contract, only those injuries or disabilities that are classified as Grade 1 may be considered total and permanent. However, if those injuries or disabilities with a disability grading from 2 to 14, hence partial and permanent, would incapacitate a seafarer from performing his usual sea duties for a period of more than 120 days or 240 days depending on the need for further medical treatment, then he is under legal contemplation, totally and permanently disabled. 
The company designated physician is expected to arrive with a definite assessment of the seafarer's permanent disability within the period of 120 or 240 days. If he fails to do so and the seafarer's medical condition remains unresolved, the seafarer shall be deemed totally and permanently disabled. The company physician was unable to timely issue a final assessment of Pastrami's disability. Such failure rendered his opinion on Pastrami's disability irrelevant. The law already stepped in and considered Pastrami permanently and totally disabled. From the case of Henry Espiritu Pastrana versus Bahia Shipping Services. Solonga was the chief cook on board the vessel MT Viking owned by Kamatis Maritime Corporation for its principal K-Line Ship Management. Back in the Philippines, he went to Kamatis to get his unpaid wages and asked for a company physician for medical consultation. He was diagnosed by the company physician with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. When he started to suffer from dizziness and chest pains, Solanga consulted a private physician who diagnosed him with cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and that he was permanently unfit to see duties. Hence, he was considered permanently unfit and entitled to the benefits under POEA Disability Grade 1. Solanga filed a complaint for disability benefits and damages among others. May Solanga be awarded permanent and total disability benefits. No, Salonga may not be awarded permanent and total disability benefits because he did not suffer work-related injuries or illness during the term of his contract as provided in Section 20A of the PUEA Standard Employment Contract. Section 20A of the PUEA Standard Employment Contract is not applicable to seafarers who did not suffer from an illness or injury during the term of his contract. Here, Salonga did not suffer any illness while he was on board the ship and in fact, he failed to present any proof that his illness manifested while he was on board the vessel. Hence, Section 20A of the PUEA Standard Employment Contract does not apply to him. Based on the case of Ventis Maritime Corporation versus Edgardo Salonga. Pacifico Manning Incorporated hired Sol as a seaman on board MV Cardo de Lisay on behalf of its principal, Industria Armamento Meridionale, and was repatriated because of an ear infection diagnosed by the company designated physician from Cara Diagnostic Center. After a surgical procedure in St. Luke's Medical Center, Sol was declared fit to work. Therefore, based on his latest evaluation, Mr. Sol does not have any hearing disability. In 2010, Sol filed a complaint for total and permanent disability benefits, sick pay, damages, and other benefits before the labor arbiter. Based on the medical certificate issued to him by his personal physician, which diagnosed him as unfit to work as a seafarer, Defendant claimed that Saul may only be awarded for coverage for permanent partial disability. Rule on the defendant's contention. Yes, the defendant is correct that Saul may only be awarded for coverage for permanent partial disability because of Saul's failure to obtain an assessment by a third doctor. Section 20B. Paragraph 3 of the PUEA Standard Employment Contract requires that after medical repatriation, the company-designated physician must assess the seafarer's fitness to work or the degree of his disability. Thereafter, the seafarer may choose his own doctor to dispute the findings of the company-designated physician. If the findings of the company-designated physician and the seafarer's doctor of choice are conflicting, the matter is then referred to a third doctor whose findings shall be binding on both parties. In this regard, jurisprudence is likewise settled on the non-referral to a third doctor whose decision shall be considered final and binding constitutes a breach of the PUEA standard employment contract 
and the assessment of the company designated physician shall prevail. Based on the case of Pacific Ocean Manning Incorporated versus Roger Solicito. Romeo was employed as a Special Operations Officer in the Quezon City Department of Public Order and Safety from 1999 until his death in 2012. Due to cardiopulmonary arrest, his discharge summary or clinical abstract shows that he complained of abdominal pain and chest pain. Records show that Romeo was previously diagnosed with hypertension in 2002. Juliet, the surviving spouse of Romeo, filed a claim for compensation benefits before the GSIS under PD number 626, which was denied on the ground that Romeo's ailment was not connected to his work and that no evidence was found that his duties increased the risk of contracting the said ailment. Can Juliet claim compensation benefits for the death of her late husband Romeo? Yes, Juliet can claim compensation benefits for the death of her late husband, Romeo, because she can base the claim on the principle of social justice. The constitutional guarantee of social justice towards labor demands a liberal attitude in favor of the employee in deciding claims for compensability. Hence, the liberality of the law in favor of the working man and woman still prevails and the official agency charged by law to implement the constitutional guarantee of social justice should adopt a liberal attitude in favor of the employee in deciding claims for compensability, especially in the light of the compassionate policy towards labor which the 1987 constitution vivifies and enhances. Based on the case of Julieta Verzonilla versus Employees' Compensation Commission, Batman and Robin are security guards employed by Cymex Security Services, engaged in the business of investigation and security services. They filed a complaint for underpayment and non-payment of wages and damages among others against Cymex and its president Rafa. Captain Marvel told them that they were relieved of their post and had to wait for further assignment because the guards on duty were reduced. But later, they were told that they would not receive an assignment unless they withdrew their complaint before the labor arbiter. Hence, Batman and Robin amended their complaint to include illegal dismissal. Simex and Rafa maintained that they did not illegally dismiss the respondents and claimed that the respondents are still included in the petitioner's Simex role of security guards. They shifted the blame to the respondents, arguing that the respondents refused to accept the available postings. Rule on the matter. Batman and Robin were illegally dismissed because they clearly established that they were dismissed without any valid or authorized cause. In cases of illegal dismissal, the employees must first establish by substantial evidence that they were dismissed. If there is no dismissal, then there can be no question as to the legality or illegality thereto. Here, proof that the employee were dismissed was shown by the offer of the sample affidavit of desistance given to them by Captain Marvel. To support their narration that Captain Marvel threatened to terminate them unless they executed such an affidavit of desistance. Such dismissal is not covered by any valid or authorized cause. Such, they were illegally dismissed. Based on the case of Cymex Security Services versus Magdaleno Rivera and Robert Iaga. In 2009, Coca-Cola Butler's Philippines issued notices of termination to 27 rank-and-file employees and union members on the ground of redundancy of their positions due to the removal of two selling and distribution systems. To Coca Union, the newly implemented systems would result in the diminution of the union membership amounting to union busting. Hence, they filed a notice of strike with the National Conciliation and Mediation Board on the ground of unfair 
day board practice. Thereafter, Cuca Union conducted a strike. The Secretary of Labor assumed jurisdiction of the labor dispute. While the case is pending, Cuca Union filed a motion for execution praying for the cancellation of the dismissal of the union members to follow the dual secretary's directive not to commit any act that would exacerbate the situation. The NLRC dismissed the complaint for unfair labor practice and declared valid the dismissal of the employees due to redundancy. Did the NLRC err by not enjoining the effectivity of the employee's termination when the dole assumed jurisdiction over the labor dispute? Yes, the NLRC erred by not enjoining the effectivity of the employee's termination when the dole assumed jurisdiction over the labor dispute. COCA violated the return to work order directed by the dole secretary. As jurisprudence dictates, the date the dole secretary assumes jurisdiction over a dispute until its resolution, the parties have the obligation to maintain the status quo while the main issue is being threshed out in the proper forum which could be with the Dole Secretary or with the NLRC. Based on the case of San Fernando Coca-Cola Rank and File Union versus Coca-Cola Butlers Philippines. Aaron was the head of the front test department of La Luz Resort owned by GRRI. Aaron violated several company policies like abuse of authority for rejecting guests and by threatening a person in authority with physical harm. When GRRI implemented a reorganization in the resort, Erin was transferred to the storage department without diminution in rank and benefits. However, Erin refused to sign the notice to transfer, which eventually led to her termination. Erin filed a complaint for illegal dismissal in money claims before the labor arbiter. Was Erin illegally dismissed by GRRI? Yes, Erin was illegally dismissed by GRRI because the dismissal was not for a valid cause. In an illegal dismissal case, the honest probandi rests on the employer to prove that the employee's dismissal was for a valid cause. In subordination or willful disobedience requires the concurrence of the following requisites. First, the employee's assailed conduct must have been willful or intentional, the willfulness being characterized by a wrongful and perverse attitude. And second, the order violated must have been reasonable, lawful, made known to the employee and must pertain to the duties which he had been engaged to discharge. Both requirements are not present in this case. While Aaron's refusal to sign the notice of transfer was willful and intentional, it was far from being wrong and perverse. So, there is no basis to dismiss her on the ground of insubordination. Based on the case of Neren Villanueva versus Ganco Resort and Recreation. Karen was hired by respondent Sintron Systems as a sales coordinator. He attended a training in the USA without any condition imposed upon her attendance. However, when she returned to work on November 7, 2013, SSI asked her to sign a training agreement that required her to remain with SSI for three years. Otherwise, she was to pay a penalty of 275,500 pesos. She refused to sign the agreement arguing that she should have been informed of the same prior to her departure for the training. Thereafter, in a meeting held in November 18, 2013, SSI's President Ken humiliated Karen and shouted at her vindictive words such as Mayabang and Mahadera. She took leave and when she returned, she was surprised to learn that Ken sent emails to clients stating that Karen had abandoned her job and accused her of intentionally hurting the reputation of SSI to the latter's clients. Was Karen's dismissal valid? Yes, Karen's dismissal was valid because gross negligence is a just cause for her termination. Here, Karen's prolonged absences without turning in vital information and deleting the files from her company-issued computer and email account 
causing injury to clients and SSI constituted gross negligence which would have been a valid ground for her termination. Based on the case of Rodessa Rodriguez v. Cintron Systems Incorporated, The Heritage Hotel Manila employed Kim Chu as a service agent on September 1, 1995. She was assigned at the hotel's restaurant Le Café. Her task included assisting and serving of the food and beverages to Heritage's guests. Two separate incidents, Chu allegedly exhibited behavior not inimical to the hotel's image, wherein she disrespected and showed discourtesy to guests. Complaints were formally filed before the Human Resource Department of the hotel against Chu and she was heard, later on penalized for suspension from work with the second penalty indicating a warning that repetition of the same act would warrant dismissal. Aggrieved by the decision, she filed a complaint before the arbitration branch of the National Labor Relations Commission for unfair labor practice, illegal suspension, and other monetary claims. Is the suspension valid and legal in this case? Yes, true suspension is valid because an employer has free reign and enjoys wide latitude of discretion to regulate all aspects of employment, including the prerogative to instill discipline in its employees and to impose penalties, including dismissal, upon erring employees. Jurisprudence states that the appropriate disciplinary sanction is within the purview of management and position. What should not be overlooked is the prerogative of an employer company to prescribe reasonable rules and regulations necessary for the proper conduct of its business and to provide certain disciplinary measures in order to implement said rules to assure that the same would be complied with. Based on the case of Heritage Hotel Manila versus Lillian CEO. Butch was hired as a butcher by Caloocan Slaughterhouse Incorporated. He claimed that he worked from Monday to Sunday from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. with a daily wage of 700 pesos, which was later reduced to 500 pesos. The next day, however, he was shocked when he only received 200 pesos due to his previous undertime and was informed that he could no longer report for work due to his old age. Kalaokan Slaughterhouse alleged that it imposed policies on entry to the premises which applied to employees, dealers, independent butchers, hog and meat dealers and trainees. They allege that Butch is an independent butcher and not an employee. Also, according to them, Butch violated the policies and he misconstrued the disallowance to enter the slaughterhouse as an act of dismissal. Rule on the claim of the slaughterhouse Kaloocan Slaughterhouse's claim that Butch is an independent butcher and not an employee is wrong because all the requisites of employer-employee relationship is present between the plaintiff and the defendant based on the four-fold test. It is settled that to determine the existence of an employer-employee relationship, four elements generally need to be considered, namely, First, the selection and engagement of the employee. Second, the payment of wages. Third, the power of dismissal. And fourth, the power to control the employee's conduct. These elements or indicators comprise the so-called fourfold test of employment relationship. It is undisputed that the petitioner rendered butchering services at Kilokan Slaughterhouse. Based on the case of Arnulfo Fernandez versus Caloocan Slaughterhouse. EQ had been the regional sales manager of Asia Brewery Incorporated for eight years and was stationed in northern Luzon. His compensation package consisted of a monthly salary amounting to 67,000 pesos and 250 pesos a day per diem allowance. The management of Private respondents split the said region into two to spur a better growth rate in its income and to give more direct and focused handling of the areas covered by these sales offices. One year and three months after the split of the NCLR, Ray, the vice president for sales of private respondent, made an evaluation of the experimental split of the NCLR and recommended the reversion to the old set of 
of putting the NCLR under one RSM regional sales manager he opened that the decision did not achieve any gain he further recommended that since the remerger would result in the redundancy in the office of a regional sales manager the office of the petitioner should be abolished on the grounds of redundancy was eq validly terminated on the ground of redundancy Yes, EQ was validly terminated on the ground of redundancy because his position has become an excess of what is reasonably required by EQ's company due to the merger. Redundancy exists when the service of an employee is in excess of what is reasonably demanded by the actual requirements of the business. A redundant position is one rendered superfluous by any number of factors such as overhiring of workers, decreased volume of business, dropping of a particular product line previously manufactured by the company or phasing out of a service activity formerly undertaken by the enterprise for a valid implementation of a redundancy program the employer must comply with the following requisites first notice serve on both the employee and the dole at least one month prior to the intended date of termination second Payment of separation pay equivalent to at least one month's pay or at least one month's pay for every year of service, whichever is higher, as reasonable criteria in ascertaining what positions are to be declared redundant. Among the accepted criteria in implementing a redundancy program are first, the preferred status, second, efficiency, and third, seniority. Based on the case of LPDOK, versus Asia Brewery Inc. Kenito started as mathematics and CAD instructor at MAMA Educational Systems Quezon City Campus and was promoted as school registrar in the Binion branch. Petitioner filed a request for early retirement manifesting his desire to reside abroad with his family. His request was however disapproved. Before the denial could be communicated to him, petitioner had already left the country. The petitioner failed to submit his resignation letter and to follow the standard company policy on proper turnover of work and accomplishment of clearance. The private respondent further contended that they were willing and ready to release to the petitioner his last salary, incentive, allowance, or recurring income and 13-month pay in a total amount of 28,000 pesos. While there was no written retirement plan, MAMA has a long-standing practice of granting early retirement, separation pay, or cash gift or benefit to those who have not reached the compulsory retirement age or mandatory 20 years of service. Respondents insist that MAMA has no company policy in granting early retirement to its employees, even if early retirement was granted to former employees such as Catolico and Crescentia. The grant thereof has not ripened into a company practice. The giving of said benefit was not proven to be consistent and deliberate. Is Kenito entitled to the retirement benefits? Yes, Kenito is entitled to the retirement benefits because he has proven that the school has an unwritten policy of granting early retirement that has ripened into a company practice. Article 100 of the Labor Code expressly prohibits the elimination or reduction of benefits received by employees. However, the basis for the grant of said benefit must be shown through an express policy, written contract, or an unwritten policy that has ripened into a company practice. To be considered a practice, it must be consistently and deliberately made by the employer over a significant period of time. Here, he was able to prove that the existence of an established company practice of granting early retirement to its employees who have rendered at least 10 years of service regardless of age with substantial evidence. Based on the case of Beltran versus AMA Computer College, Pinyan.
Airborne Maintenance and Allied Services hired Johnny as a janitor who allegedly had a heart ailment. Twenty years thereafter, the contract between Airborne and Meralco Balintawak branch expired and a new contract was awarded to Land Bees Corporation. And the latter absorbed all employees of Airborne except Johnny. According to the doctor, Johnny is fit to work but Airborne ignores the result. Johnny filed a complaint about constructive or illegal dismissal. Was Johnny constructively dismissed? Yes, Johnny was constructively dismissed because of the company's failure to observe the twin requisites of notice and hearing. In a decided case by the Supreme Court, it states that in employee termination cases, the well-entrenched policy that no worker shall be dismissed except for just or authorized cause provided by law and after due process. Dismissals of employees have two facets. First, the legality of the act of dismissal which constitutes substantive due process. And second, the legality of the manner of dismissal which constitutes the procedural due process. Clearly, the failure to observe the twin requisites of notice and hearing not only makes the dismissal of the employee illegal regardless of his alleged violation, but also violative of the employee's right to due process. Based on the case of Airborne Maintenance and Allied Services versus Arnulfo Egos. Robin Hood was a business office manager of e r Hospital and Pharmacy owned and managed by his spouses Nottingham. Later, he received a notice of termination due to loss of confidence, habitual tardiness, texting, insulting words to the employers, uttering offensive words against the employer, and texting and threatening to kill the employer and his family. Dr. Nottingham alleged that Robin Hood's termination was brought by several infractions he committed and habitual tardiness. Robin Hood, on the other hand, claims that he did not receive any notice to explain prior to receiving the notice of termination. Is Robin Hood's dismissal valid? No, Robin Hood's dismissal is not valid because the employer failed to comply with the two-notice rule. The employer must comply with the two-notice rule as mandated under the implementing rules of Book 6 of the Labor Code. The employer must serve the erring employee a first notice which details the grounds for termination, giving the employee a reasonable opportunity to explain his side. In practice, this is commonly referred to as the notice to explain. The second notice pertains to the written notice of termination indicating that upon due consideration of all circumstances, the employer has decided to dismiss the employee. Based on the case of Pardillo v. Banjojo. Petitioner Big Max alleged that in February 16, 1996, around 50 union members staged an illegal sit-down strike in Big Mac's restaurant. The union did not comply with the requirements of sending a notice of strike to the National Conciliation and Mediation Board. Neither did the union obtain the strike vote from its members and belatedly filed a notice of strike with the NCMB on the same day to conceal the illegality of the sit-down strike. The employees were placed under preventive suspension. For failure to comply, they were sent employment termination letters on February 19, 1996. On the other hand, the union members accused Big Macs of interfering with union activities. Allegedly, on February 1996, union members were asked to withdraw their membership under the threat of losing their employment. On the other hand, the union members filed a complaint before the NCMB for unfair labor practices, illegal dismissal, and damages. Upon compliance with the procedure of a valid strike, the union conducted another strike on March 5, 1996. However, the union members were disruptive and violent. Were the strikes held on February 16, 1996 and March 5, 1996 illegal? Yes, the strikes held on February 16, 1996 and March 5, 1996 
are illegal because the union did not file the requisite notice of strike and failed to observe the cooling off period. The labor code and the IRR limit the grounds for a valid strike to a bargaining deadlock in the course of collective bargaining and two the conduct of unfair labor practices by the employer. In both instances, the union must conduct a strike vote which requires notification to the regional branch of the NCMB of the conduct of strike vote at least 24 hours before the conduct of the voting. Thereafter, the union must furnish the NCMB with the results of the voting at least 7 days before the intended strike or lockout. This 7-day period has been referred to as the 7-day strike ban or 7-day waiting period based on the case of Biggs Incorporated v. Boncasas. Doggy was assigned as a counter crew cashier uh, of Jollibee franchising pursuant to service agreement between Generation 1 and the franchise operator Southgate. Under the service agreement, Generation 1 was contracted by Southgate's to provide specified non-core function and operational activities for its Jollibee Alpha Land branch. Doggy also executed a service contract with Generation 1 where specific work responsibilities to be performed by Doggy were left blank. Later, he was alleged to have committed theft and was illegally dismissed by Southgate. Generation 1 and Southgate aware that Generation 1 is a legitimate labor contractor and that the service agreement between the two companies was valid. Is Generation 1 a legitimate labor contractor? No, Generation 1 is not a legitimate labor contractor because it shows blatant badges of labor-only contracting. Jurisprudence states that labor-only contracting is declared prohibited. There is labor-only contracting where A. The person supplying workers to an employer does not have substantial capital or investment in the form of tools, equipment, machineries, work premises, among others. And B. The workers recruited and placed by such persons are performing activities which are directly related to the principal business of the employer. Based on the case of Daginod versus Southgate Foods, 